their sequel. Now, Mr. I just need to figure out what I'm doing here. You know what? Little boy, little boy, right here. A little bit. I don't want to get. No, I don't. Okay. I really don't now. Oh, yeah. We're about to be. I had a great idea. You don't have to use this now, but you should use it at some future time. When you start your video, you have a hat full of cards that have single words on them. And they're all personalities <laughs> that you adopt for the duration of the Oh video. my god! Today I'm. I love it. Uh, standoffish. <laughs> Today, Today um, I'm Toucan Sam. Pull <laughs> <laughs> your nose! <laughs> get, you, get the fuck out. Hey everybody, welcome to the next Stay Indoors podcast. We are the the Geek Gardeners. Uh, Kelly, as always, sort of running the show here uh, for the podcast. And with me, I've got Brandon. Mm. And Sean. Yeah. So today, guys, I wanted to do something a little bit... Uh, less structured, a little bit less formal than kind of what we normally do for a podcast. Um, We're formal. Because we normally have a, a degree of formality. I've not been wearing a suit and um, tie. But because we have, uh, we had a lot of news like uh, on the last couple weeks talking about E3 and everything. Yeah. I wanted to do a little bit more of just sort of a general discussion of a topic this time. We're talking about games. We're talking about video games. We're talking about video games. I like those sometimes. Yeah, me, I like them sometimes, too. I yeah. like them. Mm-hmm. That's good, man. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I you guys got that breeze. It's real nice. It's toasty. It's a toasty boy out today. That's great. Well, toasty <laughs> tonight. It's toasty out tonight. It's toasty out tonight. That's what I said. What's wrong? You said today. Real toast. Yeah, today. Uh, all day. 24 hour period. 20, all, the whole 24 hour um, of the period we got going on. <laughs> okay, I'm done with these. <laughs> <laughs> done with those. So, oh. I want to talk today about um, sequels in video games. And that includes reboots, sort of spiritual successors. Remasters. Remasters. Re- um, Renevers. And. We're going to talk about Skyrim. Probably. Well. There's kind of a lot to <laughs> talk about, so I just kind of want to open the floor on any topic that you guys want to discuss specifically but one of the things open the floodgates some of the things that i find really interesting to talk about when we're talking about sequels is um what sort of makes it worth having a sequel and like market saturation because one of the things that i think about a lot with games is with a movie or a book or something a sequel really just has to follow the narrative Mm -hmm. right Um, with a video game you also interact with it mechanically and so sometimes games are sequels because the the developers have something else that they can do with the mechanics yeah right there's like yeah. oh I can I can improve more. on that thing yeah. I can add this other thing to mm-hmm. it or whatever yeah. mm-hmm. um, and then sometimes it's just because they want to tell more of a story and the game feels very similar yeah um, so one of the announcements at E3, so it's kind of a good thing to connect from what we were talking about before, was Assassin's Creed Origins. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about Assassin's Creed. We have. And I'm wondering, ever. like, Brandon, what do you feel about, like, where that franchise has gone and how it's sequelized itself? Too many times. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh. um, they knew what they were doing, and then they didn't know what they were doing. Or they thought they knew what they were doing, and it didn't work. So you feel like there wasn't a plan? And they just realized they were making money I think, and they I think started there analyzing was, it? I, I think there was a plan, but either that person who had a plan was no longer in control, or it was the money that was running the business instead, and they were just trying to pump out annual games without thinking about the content as thoroughly. Yeah, it seems like it got hit with the Call of Duty-itis. Mm-hmm. You know and Cod's I mean? another good one example of that, where the, yeah. the market's so saturated with itself mm-hmm. <laughs> that you're just like, oh, there's another one. There's another one. It's like the war sports game. Mm Because we have one every year. And now I think they also skipped a year. Did they not? I don't know. I feel like they did. Well, Infinite Warfare wasn't that long ago. Well, yeah, no, but I think they're skipping a year after Infinite Warfare did so. No, No, because we're we're getting World War War II now. Right, yeah, yeah, no, Call of Duty can't be stopped. It's a juggernaut. And this year, (laughs) they've actually now said, too, that we're also getting the remaster of Modern Warfare 2 separate uh, from Infinite Warfare, which is a whole issue beforehand. And they're actually charging, uh, I believe... Because before you had to buy Infinite Warfare to get 
Modern Warfare 2 Remastered. Well, mm-hmm. Modern Warfare 1. Or, sorry, Modern Warfare Remastered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now they're just remastering 2. No, it's, it's the same one. Sorry, it's the same one. Oh. They're, okay. they're releasing it separate. But it was, I think, $20 more. Like, the edition. Like, you didn't just get it when you bought Infinite Warfare. You had to, like, oh, buy a special like a, edition. It was, like, a deluxe oh. pack thing. Yeah. Um, but it's... Yeah. I believe they're now selling the remaster on its own for $40. Ugh. Yeah, okay. Mm. So that's, that's like a whole thing, but <clears throat> yeah, it's not so bad. But it is, it is a, it is a marketing scheme. And yeah, like, and I think, I think the whole consumer base knows that too. Well, I mean, Infinite Warfare, they've been seeing less and less return. Like, it's still a juggernaut. It's still making a lot of money, but yeah. they're seeing less and less return on every uh, install in the last couple of years. Every iteration, they've started to go is. down. Um, but. Again, they're turning that back around. They're making uh, modern warfare or uh, World War Two. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going back to sort of the, the roots of the modern shooter craze, which started in like World War Two shooters, yeah. and I think that kind of speaks to the the over sequelization yeah. of the franchise. Like they realize that they've now their no it, their games aren't sequels to their games anymore. They're something else. Yeah. I I couldn't help but laugh when World War Two was announced. I was like. Wait, so we're just we're just we're just starting from ground one. We're just going right back to ground zero. Exactly. You guys, you guys really ran out of ideas, didn't you? Wow. <laughs> well, we really like this war because <clears throat> it's one of the things when you talk about a video game and you talk about the mechanics. Um, when we saw the trailer for Infinite Warfare, we were actually excited because mm-hmm. yeah. they didn't tell us have what it was. Played it? No. No. I don't think have no, because it's Call of Duty game. Yeah. yeah. And like once it gets to the shooting, it's a Call of Duty game. Yeah. Um, but. I was it, so into the, it, the space fighting. It showed game. off some cool promise, and there were some cool new mechanics, and that's the interesting thing, where I feel like if you have a game like that, like it's it's a problem where the marketing is in conflict with the sort of artistic desire to make a video game, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because I think oh, that yeah. if they thought they could make a game that would sell as well, they they could have like those developers could have made a really cool space combat game that could get away from the boots on the ground. Yeah. style of Call of Duty and really do some cool stuff and change things. Yeah. yeah. But ultimately it had to have um, the, the boots on the ground moment to moment gameplay that the people, the community likes. Mm-hmm. That they can go online and play basically the same game. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I don't know how you guys feel, but I think it's interesting. They've put themselves in sort of a no-win scenario because they make a new one every year and people demand that they do new things and like innovate but yep. they also need to make the same game for their fan base. Yep. Like, if you do too much different, people are mad at it. If yeah. you do too little different, people are mad at it. Yeah. Whereas if they only had a game come out every three or four years, yeah. it wouldn't be as big of an issue because you'd have those three or four years to enjoy that one game. Yeah. You wouldn't need to be like, well, there's a new one. I better play the same because I'm still playing this other one. Yeah. yeah. Half the time getting the next Call, next Call of Duty, you're just getting it because all your friends are getting it. It's like the game barely changes. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's how it is with, like, fighting games. A lot of old fighting games still work and play exactly how you want, and then you get the new one, it's like, they just made it better, I guess. And then it turns out to, like, have frame issues that you don't like if you're in the fighting community and all yeah. that stuff. But, yeah, like, I, and I mean... Character rosters. But there's even there's that, character roster, too, there. I was going to say, even at that point, though, like, most fighting games have more of, like, a fictional world and like lore to them than uh than your call of duty shooters. i think we're seeing that more now but yeah yeah but i mean yeah but i mean like like characters that people know and love and have known and love for years from like tekken and mortal kombat and all yeah. that kind of stuff right street fighter yeah like uh, even before there was really a story in like mortal kombat you got to know those characters an aesthetic and, and, and they'd add world. new ones and yeah. yeah you 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 knew what it was when you played when it. when call of duty is just like sometimes it's like it's based off of history or somewhat or real future stuff, history or futuristic <laughs> yeah thing. yeah um future history yeah but i want to uh talk actually back to the to assassin's, assassin's creed, creed point well it just creed. because of what we were talking about yeah. with call of duty um because one of the big sean you and i were talking about this the other day yeah yeah assassin's creed the core the, idea of it is uh, you can go to places to to get a better idea of how to stab a person yep like that's mm. The first game that was the idea, right? That was, was the, that was the core gameplay. That was the loop, right? Yeah, you go, you do the side missions. I understand why people had their issues with it, but the, the core idea was you go out and do these little missions to get more information about the guy you're gonna stab, yeah. mm-hmm. and then you stab the guy, 
and then you go and you do a bunch of missions Trying to get to more information about and... the next guy you have to stab and then you stab a guy and you rinse and repeat yeah. until all, awesome. all appropriate people have been stabbed until everyone that you could imagine have been stabbed so I think Stabbing is if, that, if that's the core promise of Assassin's Creed then you then look at Assassin's Creed Syndicate you look at Assassin's well I think a Syndicate's actually does does it go back to that flavor because I, I haven't played it it does a decent job I, I think that it's gotten caught up in the development that the series has taken over time and expanded on elements that don't necessarily need to need to be expanded on. Yeah. But when you go to a mission, you know, like, okay, this is the person I'm assassinating, and this is the building they're in, and these are the entry points for the building, and it highlights, like, if you speak to this person, there's a new stealth opportunity. If you speak to this person, they have a key that'll let you get in the building. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of more immediate than it was in, like, the first Assassin's Creed. Yeah. And there isn't so much build-up to it. It's kind of like, okay, now I'm going to the mission, and within this mission, there's a lot of cool opportunities to stab them in interesting ways. Yeah. Well, that, and that, like, is cool. And my biggest problem with the, the Assassin's Creed genre is, like, because it was all based on its open world, open running around, its indoor <laughs> stealth mechanics were actually really difficult to play with mm-hmm. because the game was meant to be utilized in, like, an open environment. Yeah, because the first game didn't rooftops. have, like, interior stealth. Yeah, it there was, like, like a thing. yeah, there was, like, one or few that were, like, you went inside a building that was, like, grand open archway, so it was yeah. mostly an exterior, like, environment with, like, a wall or two. Yeah. And you followed, like, a group of monks and then stabbed a guy as you were, like, blending in a bench and stuff. Like, all that stuff was super cool. Like, actually waiting patiently. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, all that stuff was super cool. You got to make your <clears throat> assassin opportunity. A lot I, a lot of the... On that note, I find that a lot of the... I, I'm, I'm just only just started Syndicate, but what I can remember from Unity is a lot of the situations you're put in where you have to assassinate someone, it's almost just like they set up this playground, and then your target just kind of, like, makes their laps, and then you have to, like, figure out where your best opportunity is and, mm-hmm. like, how you want to kill them. But yeah. I feel like in the older ones, at least from what I remember in 1 and 2... It was more like a linear thing where you would see them walking and you're like, okay, like, I feel like, like, it was, it was kind of self-explanatory that you could, that you were supposed to kind of tail them. And Mm -hmm. then there was clearly a spot up ahead that made it easier to assassinate. And I liked that part of it better because it felt more realistic. It's like, you're not just going to jump off the roof here and do it. It's like, no, you want to wait. He walks down the alleyway and gets around the corner. There's nobody around and blah, blah, blah. Like, I I get the whole thing with, with open world games. And see, this, this is another thing I have a... Uh, thing with Assassin's Creed is like uh, right now literally 10 minutes ago I was playing Dishonored and it's like because it's a level based assassination game Mm -hmm. you have so much more choice I think as a designer when you're making that game to be like these are the entryways and here's the ways you can get in and out of the building and like this is their objective and so we assume they're going to make these choices Mm -hmm. based on how we've set the level up but with Unity and with with other games like Assassin's Creed they have no idea I don't think they have any idea they have, like, your starting point, and they have no idea if I'm going to go left or right or center, and, like, they haven't planned much on my left route, which is the way yeah. I go initially. And I think, I think that's something that they fixed a little bit in Syndicate, I will say, Yeah. Um, because they add those special targets, those special, like, opportunities, mm-hmm. and they're generally scattered throughout the, like, the play space of, for one of a term level, but, like, for that particular mission, mm-hmm. okay. um, they're generally sort of scattered around, so you have to explore the environment a little bit and to find yeah. them, mm-hmm. which yeah. is neat, but I think... And that was something like Assassin's Creed. If if you assume that that is the the, the the very, very core element, everything else gone, figure out the best way to stab somebody, mm-hmm. I think that one of the problems that Assassin's Creed, and I think a lot of franchises have this, is that they've worked more and more to just add other elements yeah, as opposed to finding better ways to work yeah, on their work main, on element. main element. That's yeah. exactly what happened between 1 and 2, I think. Mm-hmm. Because in two, you're riding around horses and building your base and like using thieves and mercenaries. And like two is a great game. Two's mm-hmm. great. I love two. I'm not knocking it. No, but I think I think you bring up a valid point where because two was so good, yeah. that's the direction they went. Yeah. And I think that they could actually get away with making a game that was a lot less like two. It would actually feel very Assassin's Creed. Yeah. I, yeah. I was gonna say I feel like um, around the time where uh, Assassin's Creed one and two came out. It was very much a trend for AAA titles to expand on their mm-hmm. game, um, Make it putting just other elements in. Yeah, creating it, creating more of a sandbox experience, kind of playing how you want, kind of thing. And I feel like we're just getting to the end of that 
that hype that that I think open, that's dying open off. World um, game because people are realizing that like they like more objective based style playing and yeah. just like tell me what I've got to do and give me that job and make it well, fun. Yeah, well, yeah, like right? I don't want to go looking for the fun. Like it's the same problem that like eventually I run into in a Bethesda game. Mm -hmm. right where like that's why i love the modded community and that's why i actually went back to the console games like i don't think i could play them without the kind of mod Mods, stuff that they have I agree. Mm -hmm. because like to a certain point in bethesda games you're you're playing and this is the same with like all elder scroll games and i think that they are we'll, we'll talk about them more later but i think in in terms of open world games and their sequels it's just like we just got to put more shit in mm -hmm. and it's like i enjoyed oblivion much more because the the core quests were just better than i yeah. felt like they were in skyrim like yeah. well, i don't know if that's me but i just i just had a thought and i don't want to like derail because we are going to talk about yeah we'll, um, we'll elder talk. scrolls i just kind of want to wrap up any thoughts we have on assassin's creed mm -hmm. um but i just had a thought that because it's always felt kind of weird to me that um stuff like owning a town and buying shops yeah and getting this like massive income has become such a big part of assassin's creed and the thing yeah. is, this is so weird. I think that it was it was very much Ezio's thing, and they made it a part of his story because he was rebuilding his cities, and he ends up becoming like the master assassin for the for like the Brotherhood. Yeah, it was his He's story. like the big cheese. Yeah. So like, and you follow him through these three games, and you see him like basically rebuilding the world in in like a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then that became part of the DNA of Assassin's Creed. Yeah, even though so it doesn't in, make sense with future characters in Brotherhood, even with later with Ezio, then you're buying shops in Rome. Yeah, like why am I rebuilding Rome? What the? Fuck? But even at that point, like it didn't really bother Ooh. me because you're still playing the same character. Nice. <laughs> Ooh, excellent. Um, no, and I and I understand that. Yeah. Like you're still playing the same character, but it's a completely different part of a story, right? Yeah. Like, like did you do it in Revelations? Was it yeah, you did the same I, I thing so. in Revelation. At that point, that at that did. point, you're like, "Okay, he's in Constantinople. Why are you? Why? What's he doing?" <laughs> but it's the same thing with Rome. I feel it's like, okay, you have a well, his villa does get blown up, but now it's like you own Rome. Uh, I, I didn't get it. Like, I would have liked more, more specific base building in that thing. I don't know. You have, I think Brotherhood introduces like the towers that you have. To yeah, there's like a tower defense mechanic in Brotherhood. Yeah. yeah, and I and I kind of enjoyed that. I wish that was more of like what you were building, like those defenses. Yeah, that like you specifically put up. those those bases i wish instead of it was just like a tower defense thing it was like there was always a chance for it to be attacked by templars so you had to kind of like spend your money on setting up these defenses for your and, assassins and setting up like scouts who can then inform you when it happens so exactly. you can get there if you choose mm -hmm. to or have your defenders I mean, yeah. they, I mean, we could talk all day. That's an old game. They, there's That's probably if they made that exact game now, they'd probably have stuff more like that. Cool. Right? Yeah, but, and I, I, they, it might have been a technical limitation because there's that again. Those games are so huge, but mm -hmm. why do we need a tower defense thing? Yeah. In that game, like I think I I get it. It's fun. Um, and I did generally enjoy it. Maybe that's just the point. Yeah. But like again, now I'm like now I'm a tower defense guy in a game about stabbing people, yeah. and yeah. it's like. What the fuck am I doing at but a certain I, point? Yeah. I think on that nose again where it's kind of they where you were saying with Call of Duty how they want to release a sequel that's different enough that it's interesting, but like same enough that it's the same game and people will enjoy it and buy it. I feel like it just for the sake of it they toss over so many mechanics from a previous Assassin's Creed game and just like kept having Exactly, it the and line. I think that's They're like the interesting thing. Why? <laughs> and then you get cause then you get a game like Black Flag where the like on the ground gameplay is pretty similar to the games you played before. You like you build up your little bases for some reason because yeah. you're a pirate and you got to build up your bases. That one made the least sense. But then you've also got your pirate ship, which is clearly Ubisoft agreed. It's an, enough of a mechanic to make a game about it. Yeah. yeah. Because they're making a game about it that's basically just the pirate ship mechanics from Assassin's Creed Three and Black Flag. Like. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then. You kind of wonder, like, why was this ever in an Assassin's Creed game? And if it like, was, why did we still also have all the shop building? Yeah. And not just... Fo like, it's yeah. it just seems like they're why just like, oh, we have this mechanic still, so we'll put that one in, and we still got this mechanic, and we'll put that one in. I, yeah, I was typing in... Sorry, I was typing in, like... Uh, 
plot synopsis for Assassin, and then it just like autocorrected to like a bunch of the Assassin's Creed titles, and four was the first one that came up, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> because the game's confusing. No, because that plot. game makes no sense. It's, yeah, it just hops you around, and then like that's the that's the problem with Assassin's Creed. Once they hit four, they had no idea what they were doing, and you were talking about the naming conventions. Yeah, even. we were talking about the naming conventions of that, how it's like Black Flag and Assassin's Creed Four. Because before that. They sort of set up a system for themselves, whether intentionally or unintentionally. But you had Assassin's Creed 1 is Altair, 2 is Ezio, and then Brotherhood and Revelations are subtitles where you play still as Ezio and follow his journey. It's like a mini trilogy within yeah. the bigger series. Underneath 2. Yeah, exactly. They kind of fill in inside that space. Yeah. And then you have Assassin's Creed 3 where you play as Connor and it's a new protagonist. It's a new number. And then Desmond is connecting it all. Yeah. Desmond dies and the whole fucking franchise yeah. goes to shit because then you have Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag which is a number and a subtitle and, and a new a new main character that's protagonist. us Wait, that's that's supposed yeah. to be us but at the same time the game, like they could have made it a subtitle thing of three because it like falls within that bloodline and that like world that connor was in right so it's just like they could have just given you a new new world perspective of like a different assassin who's like grown up you know what i mean like that would have been just so much better yeah, well, they, they weirdly decided to, like, bend over backwards to make it still connected to Desmond, even though he's dead, because now, like, the technology allows other people to live through the memories of people yeah, through their, like, blood here, sample. they, like, have his body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> have really his body gross. that's... Whereas, like, there were lots of pirates. There wasn't just one pirate. He didn't have to be related to Connor. Samples taken from Desmond Miles' body. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then you get, like, yeah, Unity and Syndicate, and then there was Rogue kind of in there as well. Um, like, and now it's just all been subtitles because the other thing is when you have a game that's come out this many times, do you really want to just keep throwing numbers on there and make people feel like? Because I know when I see a number on a game, I'm like, oh, I gotta play the first one, I gotta play the second one, I got before that's I true, play that's it, right? Point. Like, and then that to speak to that, there's Persona Five, which you don't need to play any of the other ones to play this one. It's like a self-contained. Yeah, title. and like Final Fantasy does that as well. Yeah, and it's and it's like playing Final Fantasy Fifteen. I was like, oh, I'm still so lost here. I feel Final like that's an interesting one. It, we yeah, maybe touch it, on that later, it but exists, it's a very interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll we talk will about Final Fantasy there. Ten too. Yeah, exactly. That's thirteen, <laughs> that's a whole the weird third thing. one, I guess. But um, in when we're talking about Assassin's Creed, a game that I think um, focuses on stealth a lot and did become a very big sort of blockbuster franchise, but I think did sequeling right was actually the Batman series, Arkham. Yeah, yep, because. The core mechanic is you're good at punching people and you're good at choking people out. And yeah. that stays consistent. Like, Knight went a little off the rails with the Batmobile. But, like, even excluding Origins, yeah. just talking about the core trilogy by Rocksteady, um, they ba they kept the same base mechanics the exact same and gave you, like, new tools and new combos mm -hmm. and, and new abilities. And bigger ways. And we they gave you a bigger map, but, like, better ways to explore said map. Yeah, exactly. And, it and was like, things grew like sort of naturally. Mm -hmm. Like they're like, oh, you can glide and like grapple, do this like grapple launch thing. So the right. map's bigger, and like those two things felt like they grew at the same mm -hmm. rate. Yeah, it's not just like here's just a bigger map, and now just run around in it at the same pace. You know. But like Asylum did to me feel like a game that wanted to be in a bigger playground. Like when I played Asylum, I felt like maybe this is nostalgia speaking, but I felt like. That like, oh man, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could glide for longer and over places and do this in Gotham? That was kind of my like... That's uh, funny, because I never felt that. I feel like, I feel like, I kind of agree with you, but I feel like that was kind of almost what made Asylum great and like made people go like, are we going to get a sequel? Because like, I want to fly over Gotham, right? Yeah. I, and again, like, they did exactly what they <laughs> wanted to do. Like, they didn't make the open world because they're like, we're going to focus on these mechanics. Mm -hmm. Make them feel good. Because, like, the combat felt great. The Predator stuff felt great. And those are their two biggest gameplay things until the third game, which they add a whole tank driving thing. Yeah. And it's like, then you have three things to focus on, and that's it. And then you're done. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the tools and everything felt very open worldly, but the game itself was actually quite linear. Yeah, that's, I think that's kind of that's what, what it is. I, that's yeah. kind of what I'm getting at. Um, Cuz like yeah. being in the environments running around as Batman, I remember being like it's a little strange. Just like you know what I mean? There was a lot of that. You're like right I don't know. The next I, building I just, on the island. I really liked it. I thought it was really cool. Yeah. I think it's also in contrast though. It, like yeah, you think in about contrast. it, they put those they use those same mechanics and put them in a city and you're like, "Oh, it doesn't feel as weird." But then when you think, look back on it, you're kind of like, 
Yeah, it was kind of funny him trying to get around that island. Just it's probably <laughs> also because like, yeah, you don't spend a lot of time running in city because of the improved grappling mm-hmm. mechanics yeah, and gliding yeah, and totally, stuff, right? Yeah. So like, you just don't see like Batman just running around. Yeah, but, but then it's when even, you like look back, you're but like, then hmm. you think about it, like in in all media, you don't really see Batman running around. So that's why I think it's a funny image to me in, in yeah. uh, Asylum. I th- it's was, a good game. Still. Yeah, I have to joke. The other thing I was going to point out is I think it also has to do with like Asylum. There weren't a lot of like areas you couldn't land on the ground when in city part of the map like you basically have to travel by rooftop most of the time oh and, yeah and uh in asylum or in night uh they made it so like very large sections of the city for the majority of the game are like controlled by these tanks and you can't really go down or else you get fucking hunted down by one and killed mm-hmm. so i feel like they yeah. did a good way of making you use the environment to move when in asylum that wasn't a thing so you kind of just like you're in this building and i gotta go to that building i'll just i'll walk over there <laughs> yeah well, you, yeah but it was also, like, much more, like, small scale. No, way smaller, yeah, too, yeah. Right? I'm, like just thinking, you, I'm just thinking about yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I'm just also way. thinking, like, yeah. you spend more time in buildings, for example. Yeah, mm-hmm. you do. In mm-hmm. Asylum. Mm-hmm. Like, you spend less and less in subsequent you know, games. The thing I like the most about Asylum is how much the, the island, Arkham Island, changes. Mm-hmm. Throughout the yeah, entire. it's really cool. That game, like, evolves really. That's just a really well-made game and really well-made series, I think. Just like, yeah, it just evolves. You, like really you were well. saying, it's got the gameplay pillars essentially of like combat and predator, and then the third one they add another pillar. But yeah. every time they're like, okay, those are our main pillars. How do we just keep making those fun and add more to that, and then build yeah. the game up around that, right? Like they give you more tools in the sequel to do the stuff you could do in the first game better. Yeah, yeah. And then the story is also a continuation, so that's really satisfying. So you get the mechanical and narrative uh, furthering yeah. of the basically because. Uh, Sefton Hill, the creative director on the Arkham games, um, he said that his goal, you know, is to make the player feel like Batman. Like you yeah. always see, like you were talking about how in the cartoon, like Batman just like appears out of the shadows and like grabs them and whatever. Mm-hmm. But he's like, what's it like for Batman setting that up and then like getting to have the so thugs good. react? Right, that was yeah. his whole thing. And that's what I think. They and he keeps delivering well. on that yeah. every time. And I think that's the thing that's really cool is that they like they have a clear mission. Yeah. Of what they want to do as developers, they want you to feel like Batman. And they're like, okay, we made Arkham Asylum. This is the best Batman game we can make right now. Exactly. Now, a couple years later, we can make a better one. Well, they also yeah. had a way bigger budget, too, and everything. I was like, wow, this game's so great. Everybody loved it. It's yeah. Like fun all this money. Through. Yeah. And then, to talk back to Assassin's Creed, they, like, f- had this game where people liked it, but it had this criticism. I'm like, yeah, it was a little samey, though. Like, we all enjoyed it, but it was a little samey. And, like, they're like, hmm, you're right. We'll make it all about this story, then. And then it was it was a great story. It was an awesome quest, and I loved all that whole that whole classic revenge tale. Does feel very like Shakespearean, and it's so awesome that you're and like, it's so yeah. satisfying. It's so good and satisfying. And you finally get to this thing, and then you're like, boom! The whole Ezio arc, I feel like, is just satisfying. His yeah. end is it's, yeah. his character is just well written, and like Ubisoft delivered every game with Ezio. Yeah, really I, was, well. I was gonna say to give credit to Rocksteady. Um, I think they would have even had a harder job because they're dealing with a very old and loved IP. And so they, they they made this Batman game amazing as it was, and then it was also super well received by the yeah. very large audience of Batman fans who all look at Batman differently. Mm-hmm. Like whether it's the comedic 60s version or the badass uh, Bat in the Shadows, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I just think Rocksteady gets, I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. They did really good. That's hard. Um, but changing, uh, like when a stealth game shifts its gears too much sean i know that you want to talk about splinter oh. cell oh splinter cell oh i anything about splinter cell i played conviction give us give That's, us the rundown okay so <laughs> you're making him upset fuck the fact that you've only played <laughs> conviction is is like sad to me but if you go back and play any of the other ones you'll be disappointed just because like i did a little bit but not a they're lot they're like really clunky and slow now i like i really enjoyed them when i was like 15 16 because they like Again, we're like self-contained levels with objectives of both optional and like main, and it was just doing a bunch of cool things. Like you had mm. you had all these goals and a bunch of different tools and a bunch of different gadgets to do them, and you were trained basically stay in the shadows, make sure they don't see you, distract guards with whatever tools you can, and take advantage of their distraction. Mm-hmm. And so it was all about that. It was like you were rewarded for not killing anyone and for going to the stealth. You got like a higher mission completion because you were like a, a agent of the NSA, right? So it's like do your job and don't kill people because you're not supposed to. 
And it was it was really fucking cool. You felt like a super spy. You're like, I'm infiltrating this thing, I'm hacking this computer, and I'm getting the fuck out. That's my whole goal of this mission. And it's like I have to get past these fifteen guards. And then you get fucking Splinter Cell one and two and three were all that. They just gave you a better experience of that. Double agent created a, a new interesting sort of like story element in the fact that you were a literal double agent and you had to kind of like play both sides and make sure that they both trusted you like managing everybody's like trust meters so you had to do different objectives for them and sometimes doing one objective for one meant you could not do that objective for the other mm-hmm. right so you mm-hmm. had to manage between the james brown army and the nsa so one was a terrorist cell and the other one was the nsa and mm-hmm. so you had to like manage both these things and that was a cool addition to that sequel that was the fourth game that came out in the Splinter cell series and then they did conviction which is neither a stealth game it's not a stealth game. I'm just going to throw it out. You just shoot people in the head all the time. You have this auto headshot fucking button. It's literally a oh, button yeah. pressed to shoot everyone in the head. Yep. And I'm like sitting there going, what the fuck happened? In the other game, you had like an assault rifle that you never fucking used because like, why would you? Because you're not supposed to. Because you're not fucking supposed to. You know what I mean? Like it was loud. And it like it drew a lot of attention to that room. I like the idea that you have that tool though. You ha- like that's the, really cool. That's like you thing. have it, and you have to get yourself not to use it. Exactly. Well, you ha- you ha- like you could play lethal if you wanted, right? That was totally a, a legitimate way to play. I never played it like that because like then you could never go up behind a guy and interrogate them. Yeah. That was a cool mechanic that they had. You got to go up behind a guy, you grabbed him, and you're like, "Yo, tell me the information." They would give you a key code to get through Yo. a bypass, and yeah, that's exactly the fucking animation. <laughs> um, and it was all this cool stuff that you actually got to to do. Um, it was it was actually super fucking interesting. And then the new game, it kind of like eliminated that need to ever do that. You were just like a master assassin. Mm-hmm. And it was a total shift in feel of game. You know what I mean? You just shot everybody. And I was playing through it. I was like, this game's story is also super weak. What it so. like as a player was that like? Did you feel like the the franchise was kind of over at that point? Or? Well, I never went back because like. Well, I, I guess there's your answer. <laughs> well, yeah, because like, so I played the game and I was like, this doesn't feel like a Splinter Cell game. It's it's fun. It's certainly like super cool, to, like sneak around and do all these stealth missions and shoot everybody. But for me as a player, I didn't feel like it was my Splinter Cell experience. And that's such an interesting sort of phrase because like we use that thing all the time, right? Like this doesn't feel like a Splinter Cell game. Mm-hmm. It's created by the de- the developers, yeah. and it's yeah. called Splinter Cell, but, like, as a player, you're like, this isn't right. Yeah. Like, yeah. this isn't what they were trying to do in the first game, because sometimes you play a sequel, and you go, oh, cool, they're doing it better. Yeah. Like, this is what they were doing before, but now they got to do, like, the thing that they couldn't do before. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you play a game, and you're like, this is not, this was not ever the plan. Yeah. This is different. This is not the same game. Mm-hmm. And the thing is... I'm, like, sort of sad in a sort of artsy-fartsy way just because I never played the older ones. So mm-hmm. I think of Splinter Cell and I think of Conviction. Yeah. Um, and I think Conviction was a really fun game and I really enjoyed playing it. I was going to say, it's like, you and I both enjoyed Conviction. Yeah. You and Jack played it a bunch. I played yeah. with Jack quite a bit. And that's funny to hear that, that side of it. That it's like, it wasn't a it wasn't a Splinter Cell game. Like, it had a cool co-op mode, yeah. which was, was super awesome. And the thing is, is, like, the third game i think actually had a co-op mode and the fourth game had a co-op mode but it was the same splinter cell thing where you both had to be sneaky sneaky and like Mm -hmm. and choke someone out so one person would like and then the other person would come around the corner and they'd be like and they would snag them as the person was like oh what and then somebody'd be like you had an emp pistol and you'd like take out the light and then somebody would like use that as like a time to sneak around grab a guy one person would interrogate the other guy would be like talking over the radio be like this is the code because there's there's elements like that in the conviction stuff where you can like one person sneak up behind a guy and like do that stuff but i think it's interesting because they were clearly trying to deliver on like a different promise in conviction right like like getting more action oriented and like and i think that that's a good game but it's so strange to me that and I, I know why there's a lot of um, sort of corporate stuff that goes on there and a lot of like the publishers yeah. are like, we have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. We have to make them all action games. So yeah. it happened to Dead Space as well. Yeah, um, exactly. And I think that... Dead Space used to be slow and lumbering. It sucks because like Conviction, this is the other thing. I think Conviction could have been like a new franchise. 
Yeah. And then they could have done new, more interesting things. They could have done way different stuff. And it's I think the they... Assassin's Creed problem of yeah. if Black Flag had just been a different game from the been beginning, a, which is what we're getting game. now, been a pirate game, Yeah. they could have had more freedom, mm-hmm. but they had to include all the stuff that they feel is now in the DNA of their previous games, which weirdly ends up tying them down and limiting them when they're trying to do new stuff. Yep. So both things suffer. The new ideas suffer because they're tied to the old ones. Yeah. And the old ones suffer because they're not growing. They're just having a bunch of other stuff piled on top. Exactly. And I think that in that scenario, if Conviction had started a new franchise and it was this like action stealth game. Yeah. And I would have played the shit out of it. And they could have had a, a different setting and had some new mechanics that were like really, really neat and really different. Yeah. But instead they were like, we're going to kind of, because like I said, it was like, it's kind of like the stealth from the other game. Yeah. But they could have diverged more. But yeah, the, if like, they weren't trying to be like, see guys, it's Splinter Cell. Look yeah. at how much it's like Splinter Cell. Yeah. No, it's just like the whole massive amounts of like killing. Like all your problems could be solved the same way with a gun, and that's the thing I love the most about Splinter Cell in the old games is like, killing was kind of like a thing you never allowed to do. Mm-hmm. At least how I played, right? And like, and the killing was was awful. It was hard to pull off. So it made it like twice the gamble for like maybe a success. Yeah, like like you were saying. Splinter Cell Conviction, you mark them and there's literally a button that just headshot everybody. Yeah. That's very clearly telling you that, like, you should be killing everybody. Yeah, yeah and right? And yeah. how many people did you kill in Splinter Cell, right? Yeah. Oh, like, like prob- all of them. Probably all of them. In every order. single every single body. In every other fucking Splinter Cell game I played, I probably killed less than three people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I killed, like, a one target that you're supposed to, like, eliminate and then everybody else is like, yeah. cool. My, my other thought on that was that I feel like that time the convention came out, I just looked it up, it came out in 2010, um, is around the same time where that, like, AAA um, mainstream title was, like, huge. So I feel like during a time where unique and original IPs were dying off um, and weren't selling as well, and I, 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 I can't think of any other games, but I can I can definitely, I definitely know that there were other games who did this, where they added a mechanic to their game that fit more in the world of AAA popular titles yeah. to try and sell more units. Well, Dead Space... Dead Space did that exact same thing. Oh, really? Thing. I they, don't know how Dead Space Dead Space either. went from being, like, a really slow, really methodical... Yeah, we played the first one. <laughs> ...thriller. Yeah. Like, obviously, it was a shooter, and you, in, in a sense, and you had the capability... Well, it was a survival action. Yeah, and, but you, you had the capability to like kill Resident most Evil, things. like, ammo was scarce, and, like... Yeah, yeah, like, you had the capability to yeah. kill most things and sort of solve your problems with a gun, so to speak, mm-hmm. but you needed to be careful and like things would attack you from unexpected directions and like horrifying new monsters and and you couldn't really run you were pretty slow and you needed to be really precise and And love the gun in that game and it was very claustrophobic and you were by yourself Mm -hmm. and then as the franchise went on and i've i've watched some videos as well as reading some stuff and basically it was very much a uh a a publisher sort of money driven thing of like We gotta go action. We gotta go big. We gotta go blockbuster. We gotta go mm. uncharted. We gotta like exactly. So they and started having so these big set game. pieces and like giant monsters that are just there Ugh. to be like huge. And it's like much faster and more of a shooter. And well, yeah, I remember Mark Brown, who like I watched his three video essays on yeah. that. Yeah, and it was like there was there was clearly a, the clearest thing you could see, and it's the same thing about like fucking Splinter Cell. It's that it's the how you aim and move. Your mm. movement became so much smoother in, in uh, fucking, what's it called, uh, uh, Conviction, as opposed to Double Agent. And it's the same thing between Dead Space 1 and 2. Mm. You could move and aim pretty pretty efficiently mm-hmm. so that you never needed to stay in one spot. Um, in Dead Space, they never kind of went with that. They always let you no, move yeah. and shoot. But, yeah. but, but slowly. But, but it was slow. Yeah. You, you when move, you bring your gun up, you walk slowly. You, yeah, and I thought... You, you know what, change me, the way you shot your gun and like... Yeah. yeah. And for me, it felt like that Isaac Clarke has really taken his time making this shot because he only has a few amount of bullets. He doesn't know when he's coming across his next ones, so he has to make sure that he's got to take that shot really well. So and he's got to go slow. I don't want to. I want to let you keep going, mm-hmm. but also it plays into the fact of like, who are you playing as? Yeah. Isaac Clarke is an engineer. Exactly. He's not a trained marksman, right? Yeah. And it kind of fe- feeds into that feeling Idea, of right? like, this guy is slow to aim because this guy is slow to aim. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like. Yeah. He's he's not, he's not just he's, pulling he's out a, a gun and like popping people off. He's afraid of dying. Yeah, exactly. And I would almost like to see that game in terms of like how fucking cool would it be if there's a little bit of like aim resistance. Like you had to like, uh, ooh, do you, boom, oh, okay, got it. Like yeah. you know what? That would add more to the tension if your shots didn't line up because your your character didn't aim properly. So when you moved, like your aim kind of was harder to shoot. Mm. You know, it swayed a little bit. 
but if you stood your ground, it was a little bit easier. So you, as a player, have to be like, ooh, stick your ground and shoot, stick your ground and shoot, okay, move, 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 shoot, move, shoot. Yeah. It would add to the tension of the survival horror game, but I don't think they did that because they wanted it to feel more controlling, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, like, that the, power fantasy. 360, exactly. no scope. And Dead Space started <laughs> out as, like, a, a, a disempowered fantasy, and it became a power fantasy. Well, yeah, mm. eventually you like, flying around and fucking blowing up ships, and you're like... It was it was oh. silly, it was fine, but it was it was silly. That's disappointing. I didn't know it got like that. I'm yeah, like, Dead Space. Uh, a... uh, but to its credit, Dead Space One, Two, and from what I played of Three, I never finished it. Uh, they're still fun games. Like, three is co-op. Too, yeah, I think. just <clears throat> yeah, it does. But three is co-op. But again, yeah. it's it's that it's a fun game, but it delivers on a different promise. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that's always disheartening because you're like. I got the sequel to this game because I wanted more of the thing that this game has. Well, we, yeah, and we originally picked up Dead Space for the horror thriller aspect of it because we kept finding cool uh, single-player games for us to kind of, like, toss a controller around and play together, hang out play together, yeah. Um, Bioshock Infinite was the first one we did, and that one was a fantastic game to do that with. Yeah, it was really good. Um, Because you don't really need to play the entirety of Infinite to really get the feel of it. You're like, yeah, you're like, oh, I get it. Well, yeah, because, yeah, Infinite is a very uh, it's a very interesting case where the the gameplay of it is is a pretty straightforward first person shooter um mm-hmm. but the beyond that the world and the storytelling is oh it's beautiful is what you want is what it's you there to see kind of thing. crazy yeah. playing a game yeah. is like one thing but watching the game is another thing but even but even dead space like even though you have those mechanics of like of like being slow and everything it, the, the still the basic third person shooter mechanics are there yeah um it's just they're a little clunky and that has to do but the but you but it it makes sense almost immediately because you're you get put in the atmosphere and you're like okay no, exactly. i get it i'm i'm scared <laughs> like, yeah. super scared the worst thing that can happen for games is for them all to just feel the same exactly right? like, not every like your mechanics tell a story too your mechanics create a feeling and a tone like yeah, maybe it's a little old school, but like an example of like you were saying was the old Resident Evils where you literally had to like stop and you like aiming yeah. wasn't precise like the old ones where you it was like just like an isometric view and oh, you yeah. just like point in the general correct direction and hope that that's the one you need to be in to, mm-hmm. to kill the thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that camera does something for you as a player, very specific. Yeah, it's very different from being in a first person perspective and having like perfect yeah. aim on the axis. Well, where you about, want to hit them yeah and another thing about Resident Evil is that, like every time you opened a door it played like this cutscene of opening a door so every time you as a person was like why do I have to wait so long for this door to open why do I open and then they take forever and then sometimes there's things and you're put back into the old room and there's zombies now you gotta yeah. fucking deal with it and then now like and I find this is like with every horror game like this happened to Resident Evil so I tried playing I think Resident Evil 6 was the one with co-op no Resident Evil 6 was the newer one Resident Evil 5 was the one with co-op. I played mm-hmm. Resident Evil 4 mm-hmm. and a little bit of Resident Evil 3. But when I got to Resident Evil... Play five. I played Resident Evil 4 and it felt like... It, it was pretty action-heavy as far as like survival mm-hmm. horror games go. Like There's a lot of guns uh, and you fucking did a bunch of things. But the beginning of that game really made me feel like... Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're like being hunted by like literally just like 13 dudes and I have like 6 bullets. And I'm like, oh, I'm not getting out of here alive. I gotta run. Um, and so that was like it was a literal way for the game to tell you you can't win this fight you're fucked so run hide scavenge what you can come back with a shotgun kind of thing yeah um, and then Resident Evil 5 it also was this action game in uh, and there's a lot of controversy I remember with, uh, with Resident Evil 5 because it was set in Africa and you're basically yeah, so you're, just yeah. shooting only colored people and it was like really I that yeah we, yeah. You're like a white American, and it, it was, was like, it was like if I remember correctly, it was like African tribes that were getting this disease that was yeah. like turning them into zombies. But then because of the way the plot was, yeah, you were only you're killing shooting zombies. Black people. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So it, was it was yeah, it was it was strange, and like I think they they changed it. But regardless, I remember that being weird controversy. I don't mm-hmm. remember reading a lot about it, but I remember being like, uh, I still ended up trying to play this game. And it did not feel like the fourth game at all. I was like, okay, so it kind of plays the same, but I'm running around shooting. I'm hunting these things down at this point. Like, I'm yeah. like running at them yeah. with and a shotgun. Like, mm, I feel like something went wrong I feel like somewhere some- along here. Something changed. I remember yeah. I remember Resident Evil 5 came out around the same time that Gears of War was still extremely popular. Yeah. And for whatever reason, like, that was the game I contrasted with because I was also playing co-op Gears with, uh, I believe it was Justin at the time. 
Um, so I remember getting into Resident Evil 5, and, and I didn't even, like, I, thinking originally, I was like, oh, Resident Evil is like a horror thriller series, so when Justin was like, yeah, let's play this co-op, I was like, okay, like, I don't really like horror thriller games, but sure, but it was just a slightly slower moving, but, like, Japanese third-person shooter. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and it was just co-op. It was like, oh, hey, there's a zombie. You want to pick it up? Cool. And it was just moving around shooting zombies. And that was like yeah. all it was. And it wasn't that it wasn't fun, but uh, it, like it, I knew from an outside point of view that that wasn't what Resident Evil was supposed to be. And I was yeah. kind of like, oh, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was just, um, yeah. So I, I didn't end up playing it just because it kind of like decided to go in a way different, a way more action heavy that like I found four strike struck a good balance for me as a new player. I'm like, yeah, this is a little disempowering, but overall, I still get my bazooka eventually. You know yeah. what I mean? So, like, I still felt like I had, as long as I managed my resources well, I felt like I had the upper hand. Yeah, cool. Um, and I feel like the fifth one did away with the resource management altogether. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. a herb took up the same amount of space as a shotgun. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, yeah that's because so, you had a you had a dial instead of like a pack space that yeah. you had to manage. So you could yeah. like Tetris in the other game to like get enough fitting, get more stuff in your exactly yeah. if you like were smart about it. Um, mm. And then as further iterations upon that game came out, less and less. You yeah, do that. It, it, it makes me think of another thought of like um, developers of series that are so long, like Resident Evil, that have been out for years and have a following. Yeah, um, there definitely is an argument there to create a more mainstream style gameplay to invite newcomers Um, because when you have series that are so old that people aren't going to go back and play the original stuff like that right you want to make it easy for someone else to pick it up not that i necessarily think that as a good reason but i definitely think that's something that crosses some of these developers minds when they're doing these sequels and it's like how can we make this so like call duty fans can come play this game and i kind of touched on that earlier yeah but again Mm. i don't i I would be surprised to hear that that was a thought going through developers as opposed to publishers. Right, yeah. Well, that was, that's what I mean. That's what I yeah, mean. like, publishers definitely are like, more people buying the game, and developers are like... Uh, I should be better at saying developer and publisher. It's a, yeah. it's a niche thing for horror games. We just have to accept that they're not going to sell as much as... They're not going to sell right? as like, And yeah. I think the people making those games are okay with that, mm-hmm. because they're those people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're like, I want to make a game that's going to freak someone out. Yeah, that's a that's a team that you want to be a part of. You want to do that, right? Yeah, I'm and, I, I'm hoping that the industry is now realizing that making these more unique uh, style games. Uh, yeah, you won't sell as many units, but you end up getting more of a following. So you well, can I then make you, more you, later down the road, and you can sell stay them. consistent. Yeah, I think we're getting. I think two factors are help are hopefully helping move the industry in that direction. Uh, one of them is the big push in indies right now. Yeah, so of ones that pressure. have like next to no budget comparably uh we're getting a lot of indies that basically take a single mechanic and iterate on that um and that uh, and that's how they get their game design and then people can play it because they find that mechanic inviting or interesting and if an indie does get a sequel it's more of that mechanic exactly generally speaking well like bro um it's like that yep it's just you're a little robot and you're wobbly and you climb things whoop de doo it's a weird platformer and you, you grow this giant plant yeah and that's that's it's you jumping around like that's all it is jumping yeah. around and climbing things so you're a climbing boy yeah you're climbing you assume that robot's gender uh it's a robot says bud and I'm pretty sure mom refers to him okay so you didn't assume him. assume no one's gender that's good you're very accepting Sean <laughs> thank you what's gender it's just a construct we give ourselves fuck off uh, um but any the, games <laughs> but the other thing that I was gonna say is that we also have um developers that are willing to sort of uh, buck the trends of like the hardcore commercialism and stuff like guys like CD Projekt Red who are like we're gonna do this our way and we're not gonna over microtransactions or we're not gonna like charge too much for the DLC and we're like they're really passionate about having their community of supporters yeah and they do The Witcher right? yeah that's The Witcher cool. guys cool 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 um, and they're and they're just very excited that like people are playing their games and find them exciting, and they're not think and they're not looking at the consumer base as like just like wallets. Yeah, they're looking at them as people who enjoy this artistic thing that they've done because mm-hmm. it's and, fucking dope. And the return on that is that there are people who like we have seen nothing of cyber Cyberpunk, cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, like nothing about that game except for mm-hmm. the original reveal trailer. And people are so jazzed about it because yeah. they're like, I don't care. CD Projekt Red is making it. I'm buying it. Yeah. Like, yeah, Ubisoft announces true. a game, and they're like, okay, um, 
I'll wait a year and maybe. Yeah, maybe everybody I know who bought I'll Syndicate see waited until it was on sale. Yeah, but like CD Projekt Red is like, hey, we're working on a new game, and everybody are like, okay, when can I have it? Mm. Yeah, and how much money can I give you for it? And I think like, hopefully in the next few years we'll start to see that the, like publishers will start to learn too that it's much more valuable to actually build returning customers and build sort of a, like a loyal fan base for one of a better term mm. who are excited about your stuff. Like if Rocksteady says they're making a game of any kind, I'll probably buy I'm it. buying it. Yeah, for like, sure. I don't if it's a first person shooter, I'll buy it because it's Rocksteady and like it's probably gonna be really really freaking cool. It'll yeah. be about time travel. Yeah, like there'll, there'll be something about it, and like I don't even care. Like I'm gonna, I'm yeah. gonna buy that game. That Titanfall two level was so good. Yeah, it was. It was freaking great. Um, Titanfall two actually, that's an interesting one where they added a campaign and they, did yeah, the whole thing. Battlefield like, two is doing the same thing. Yeah, they're like, hey, we we didn't give you guys what you wanted. A hundred percent, we're gonna fix that. Yeah, and then they did, and it was good. It was good. I thought it was, I, it was a really good was, campaign. It was pretty campaign standard for two. first person shooter campaign made really good use of mechs and I liked it's it. the thing is it used its mechanics really well yep integrated them into both yeah. like the world and there was cool free running the gameplay f- f- sections where you had to free run and you could cloak around and it was dope I liked it that bit where you have the smart pistol and it's just like a free run escape yeah it's so good there's a lot of really cool cinematic moments in that in that campaign yeah. they also fixed their smart pistol and they're online yeah. They're like, yeah, people don't like it, so we'll just make it a fucking burst that you use for a little bit. I'm like, thank you. Because it's a cool idea. It's a cool idea, but it's so overpowered. Yeah. Everybody had it. Yeah. It was just like, oh, bam, you're dead. Bam, you're dead. Bam. Jeez. Yeah, because it was just a gun in the first one. Yeah. That you yeah. could just have. Jeez, jeez, it was why? just, yeah. yeah, it was like the last thing you unlocked, but it was just your sidearm. <laughs> and yeah. so everybody, everybody had it and just used that. Because why wouldn't you? Because why wouldn't you? And then when mechs came, some people, like, stowed them for their mag launchers, which was also, like, fucking annoyingly good in that game. The mag launcher in the first fucking Titanfall, because I remember playing a lot of Titanfall 1, it was... Yeah, you did. It was fucking stupid. It would just be, yeah. like... It would take a Titan from, like, probably in a full clip from here to, like, there. So if anybody else was shooting the Titan at all, it would just be, like, boom, 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 boom. Jesus. That all... I, I, I think I enjoyed the Titans more in... No, Titanfall 2 did a better job. <laughs> no, it just did. Titanfall 2 is a really good game. should plug that game back in. We should. Yeah. Um, we touched briefly on it before, and I want to get back to it, is the Elder Scrolls series. Yeah. Because that's an interesting one where, like, obviously there's graphical improvements, but on the surface, mm-hmm. they seem very similar. Yeah, but the thing... And, and so, when I was super young, I played Morrowind, and I don't remember a lot of Morrowind, so I can't really talk to it. Okay. But what I can talk to is how much I played fucking Oblivion. And I'm kind of proud, kind of ashamed to admit it, that in one summer I spent 500 hours on this game. Jesus. Yeah, I know. Um, again, kind of proud, kind of ashamed. I didn't have a lot of friends. I did have Oblivion, though. And Oblivion Dude, was great. And you I played that the... game to Oblivion. I... <sighs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> 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 But no, I, I played it, I played it a fucking <laughs> bunch, and I really liked it, and I played all the quests, and I fucking did everything, and I, I had one character that I sunk 400 hours into, and I did all the DLC with that, and then I played Oof. another character for 100 hours, and it was just fucking dumb. The, the Skyrim, I think I sunk still a fair decent amount of time into Skyrim, but for me, what was really lacking was like, just didn't feel like anything was really worth doing in Skyrim. Like, even now, I, I go back and I've played Skyrim's hundreds of editions that have come out over the years. And it's like, they're fun. It's fun to play, but I felt like Skyrim was a little harder to find the fun than it was in... Um, Oblivion? Oblivion. Like, Oblivion's, like, Thieves Guild quest was so fucking cool. With the whole Gray Fox esque thing. So is that what it is? Is it like more mission design than mechanics or Yeah, well I mean also the mechanics like Oblivion had a bunch more <clears throat> skills and attributes than Skyrim and, and some of them that they got rid of, like they got rid of athletics, I think. Yeah. And just gave you So you can't like no, it was... to jump over buildings and shit? <laughs> yeah, it was fucking dumb. <laughs> um you can still is do that, that if you get thing? to the command console. Well you could get you could get a jump height of like something like three times normal yeah. in oblivion like it was stupid without modding the game at all yeah like, you, you can just, just like train your athleticism exactly yeah. you can just and that's how you climb mountains 
Yeah. Um, or you create paintbrush bridges. Paintbrush br- I love that fucking glitch. It was so fun and stupid. Uh, yeah. In Oblivion, if you dropped a... Like, you could hold, like, random items in your inventory yeah. that didn't do anything. And you could drop paintbrushes, but for whatever reason, there was a glitch with the paintbrushes where yeah, they would just, like, float in place and you could, like, stand on them. Oh. So people would use them to, like, break the game sequence and, like, go places you're not supposed to by, like, creating <laughs> these, like, flying paintbrush bridges. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So the people just carry a hundreds with them. Yeah. And this. They got up. I think there's, like, one part of the Dark Brotherhood guild. The Dark Brotherhood was also just better in fucking uh, Oblivion. Like, in Skyrim, it's like, you're on the fringe of the Dark Brotherhood. But I, but anyway, like, the quest design I just found to be better. Um, the Oblivion gates were all really samey, but I found them to be at least more content, more fun. More dungeon divey than just a dragon out of nowhere. Like, that was Skyrim's thing. I was going to say, mm. from somebody who's kind of only really played the surface of those games, like, a lot of them, it's kind of like, I go into them, I have a lot of fun creating character, I kind of get into the world a little bit. Um, more recently with Skyrim, I get some mods from, like, oh, my armor's really cool. Beyond that, it's just like, I don't know, it's just like the type of game isn't necessarily for me, it's just a lot of anything, and I don't really mm. get into them. But <clears throat> from what I can, I was going to say, like, is it kind of, do you think Skyrim relies too much on, like, dragons? Like, yeah, you know like what? It's just like, oh, look, there's a dragon. There's a dragonborn. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, every Nord wants to tell you about the dragonborn. I just felt like Elder Scrolls Oblivion didn't give you as many fun quests to go on. I mean, it's Skyrim. Skyrim. Sorry, yeah, no, Oblivion gave you more. Oblivion was just like, here you go, here's a bunch. And, like, there's some notable ones in Skyrim that I discovered, and maybe maybe that's part of the problem, is I also, because of how much I played Oblivion, <laughs> yeah. I fucking found them all. Yeah. And how much I didn't really play Skyrim, I just didn't find them all. Um, but I remember big, right away in Oblivion being like, getting into the fighter skill, because I just didn't know what I was supposed to do, so I like, got to like, oh, it's on the fighter skill. And I like just did it, and I was like, wow, this is fun. So you had to go to a new town to do the second part. And then go to a new town to do the next part, and like you felt like there was a progression going on, and it may have felt a little chory to some, but I actually felt like it was cool. So that by the time I had made it to the top, I was like, I earned this. I'm a fucking dude now. Now I'm gonna go learn magic, and it was so ridiculous that my guy was just the thing, the hero for everything. Well, I feel like I feel like that's just a thing in the Elder Scrolls, that's- right? Yeah, and it's like all the Elder Scrolls games are like that when you're yeah. fucking you're the the head of the companions and a werewolf and the dragonborn and a fucking you can't be a vampire at the same time as a werewolf, which sucks. Um, but <laughs> oh, darn, like, oh darn! But if you could, <laughs> the one though, thing I can't do, the one thing you can't do, and then you're the head of mage guild. I'm sure and a mod. The fucking dark brotherhood yeah. and the thieves guild, it's just fucking ridiculous they're like you're just running the world by the end of yeah, it and, and you're, like, you're also like a general in the fucking like civil war <laughs> and you're like how is there anybody who ever opposes me yeah i am a god yeah exactly i don't know this the games are also just fucking weird like they're all weird and the thing is they don't really change that much like oblivion to skyrim didn't really change much at all mm. but i just remember i think i just remember enjoying oblivion a lot more well, there's got to be something said for that. I, yeah. That's that's really interesting. And I know that people who played Morrowind say the exact same thing about Morrowind. They're like, I just enjoy Morrowind a lot more. I wonder if it's a little bit of just sort of the shifting baseline nostalgic element. Right? Yeah. Of like, that's the one that I first spent all this time in and I learned it yeah. so well that like small changes to the formula stack yeah, I feel up like, over time. I feel like those games are so big and so expansive that... You, you, you when you get first introduced into them you go like so Morrowind is the first one you go into Morrowind you learn that world you learn everything that's in it you get into the armor and the gear and all the characters and you're like this is awesome and then you go into Oblivion or Skyrim and like the one thing's different you're like ah I don't know it's not as interesting as Morrowind that was, my, that was, was my favorite and, thing yeah. yeah I guess so and that, and that might be exactly what happened to me but you're I also, waiting to play like a second version of Oblivion but it ends up yeah. being it's a different game yeah, I also remember the DLC just being so fucking good, and I, like, played the DLC for, like, um, Skyrim, and it's just, like, you just go to a different island that's, like, part Skyrim, part uh, Morrowind, mm-hmm. and it's, like, run by Dark Elves, and it's, like, it's kind of cool, but, like, it's not as cool as the fucking Shivering Isles in Oblivion, where you literally go to Shergoth's realm, and he's, like, one of the Daedric Princes, mm. and he's the one of Madness, so, like, literally the world is divided in half of uh 
mania no it's dementia and yeah dementia and mania so like they're different <laughs> so people in dementia are like a little stranger and then people in mania are just like up and down and up and down and up and down and people in dementia i don't think know what's going on they're like in a completely different world yeah and it's fucking really cool because right in the middle of the the fucking thing is the palace and Shiagat's realm is in the middle of that. Hmm. So right in the center of the fucking like whole island of Shiagat's realm is his fucking throne room. And it's like weird and ridiculous and you go on this weird fucking zany quest around this fucking weird island that I'm forgetting what well, you do. Well, DLC is actually an interesting thing in video games where you get these kind of like mini pseudo sequels mm-hmm. or like expansions like we're getting standalone dlc now that's just kind of like a smaller game that uses just basically the same mechanics of the other game introducing maybe one yeah item but like uses the same engine at the very least Mm -hmm. and then might be like yeah we're gonna tweak this now and now this this like piece of gear works this way yeah in the dlc like i'm actually going back and playing um uh the finishing off the dlc for shadow of mordor because Shadow of War is going to yeah. be coming out. And it's funny because I didn't really notice it because I, I, I played the game and I sort of started up the DLC and I was kind of like, oh, you know what? No, I need to take a break. I can't just... I just, like, binged the game. I yeah. need to slow down. So I didn't play it for a while, but I went back to it. And the way they kind of handled their DLC is that with the Bright Lord DLC, it's very, very focused on the mechanic of, like the like the branding and the taking people over Mm -hmm. they've added this thing where like at any time basically it's on a cooldown but you can just like summon five minions to you who are just like assumed to have been controlled at some point Mm. and you can like call them to your location and then it's on a cooldown and then you can summon your five guys and if you happen to have like a captain or like a commander or something under your thrall that one of your guys is replaced by him so you can like call in like a, a second in command who's like a beefier guy. I was actually really sad. I let him die, and I was like, "Oh, he's been with me through so many things." Um, <laughs> that's funny. Wait, but like, so that's like the mechanic. But you also seem to lose health a little faster. Like you're not as defensive. But at any time, you can press down on the D-pad to like kill all of the guys that you have currently in your thrall and regain health for the number of people that you kill. I oh, okay. Doesn't I know you can kill them all in uh, the the base game. Oh, can you? I've, I'd forgotten. Yeah, you but can you kill also, all the branded ones, but I also gives get you health. Health back for them, and also now your, like your wraith flash, brands people. So you have an area oh. of effect branding move. Damn, that's dope. So you're just gonna do these huge fights, and also you have the one ring, and you charge it by branding people. Oh, and when okay. it's charged, it gives you unlimited. Uh, it like fills your health, it refills your elf shot, and it gives you like unlimited executions. So you like can special just moves, brand, so you brand, can just brand. keep branding people or keep doing wraith flashes and like get the the group. Mm-hmm. So like you brand enough people to charge it, and then you do that, and then if you do start losing health, you just kill them all and start again. And it's just very like you just like mow through guys. Yeah. And it's really it's cool. more so than like in the base game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like they just added a couple little things, but they're like this mechanic. We're gonna expand on like just the the rest of the game is like the exact same, mm-hmm. but we're just gonna do more with this one thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that's really interesting, and it's kind of what I want from sequels in a way. Like obviously, mm. sequels you want to expand on all of the mechanics. Yeah, but and it looks like they're doing that for Shadow of War. Yeah, but it's just a cool like microcosm of like the idea behind making a sequel mm-hmm. yeah. of that expansion of like okay, we've got this thing. How can we tweak it? How can we do more? <clears throat> right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I thought it was really really cool. It was very very interesting. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to say about Elder Scrolls? Not really. No. 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 Do we want to? Do we want to mention uh, Final Fantasy? Yeah. Really you know quick. what? We talked. We we talked. We, we talked. Oh, we talked about it. We, we talked it. We talked I about. I mentioned Final oh. Fantasy. <laughs> we talked about <laughs> back in nineteen dickety you know, In my <laughs> day, they only had Final Fantasy one. So Final Fantasy. Now you got ten, two, it's fourteen. A, yeah. Hmm? It's a very. Um, I think the thing that you kind of realize as you were as you were mentioning earlier is that they are standalone games for the most part. Like, every one you could basically pick up and, like, they're new characters and it's a new plot and you can just, like, let's get going. But a lot of the things that they that they they do cross over are kind of, like, the world mm-hmm. and the weapons and the mechanics that work in the game and a lot of them aren't always explained. Um, one that um, I know is very strong in the Final Fantasy games is the magic 
portion of it. Yeah, Blizzard. Um, uh, like they have, like they there there's there the the basic spells are really basic. It's it's like fire, thunder, blizzard, and whatever other ones like healing and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But then they start getting weird named like Blizzara and Blizzaga and like that's Thundaga like the upgraded whatever. It's version. Like the upgraded of it, right? version. Yeah. And then every game has a different way of like how you get to that better version of the magic yeah um and i feel like not all of them are explained in those games and there's and and it's not only that it's the terminology they use in a lot of the games you're like blah 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 blah, and you're like what is that and you wouldn't have known unless you played the the last two games where they told Mm. you what that thing was i think that's actually a problem they have in um assassin's creed as well yeah it's like a quick touchstone we're like yeah i go to do something in a game because it's so similar to the previous ones and yeah. it works but I like realized that the game never told me that was a thing I could do yeah, yeah. I've just like yeah. I just know I can do it yeah and I think that that's a problem like yeah. you need to like assume make a game that is like feels like a continuation of the first one but assume that like the person hasn't played it you know what I mean like mechanically which I, I, I think is a really really tough thing to do because like we yeah. all get really frustrated when we have to go through these lengthy tutorials and we're like you don't play the game no, play the game, right? Because there's the definitely like a middle ground. There's a middle ground, like where you don't tell a person everything and go through this step by step tutorial, but you also like make sure they know what they're doing and then know that they have the options available to them. Mm-hmm. Well, tutorials are, are a whole other thing in game because there's so many ways to teach someone how to play their game, and like there's great videos out there, like well, tutorial or like beginning level or whatever, right? Yeah, the tutorial level should teach you. I think through its level design, helpful hints, and like overall mechanics mm-hmm. it shouldn't be like stand in a white room and teach you how to jump over equally white blocks yeah. like assassin's creed is yeah. always yeah but i also i do think that like we're getting off topic but i just want to now we're talking about tutorials um i do think that especially as like with more sort of triple a big budget like pseudo realistic games I think that like the tutorialization is important because there's just so many moving parts and so many intricacies that like they need to sometimes they just need to tell you like this like these are things that you can do Mm -hmm. so that you know you have those tools Mm -hmm. like like the Arkham games for example like Arkham City even it expands so much in Arkham Asylum that like you need to know that you can if you cape stun somebody you can like run up them but then flip off them and land on somebody else as opposed to just knock them down yeah, yeah like that's stuff that like the game you would never figure that out there's no way for you to to we button mashed and that's how we figured it out <laughs> i think I, I, well, I, th- I think it tells you that's what i mean like oh, i think okay. there's a thing in the game that like I lets you know it tells you. i think it does i think it's like when you get the move like in the upgrade menu or something oh yeah it's like a thing that like mentions it but like that's like even that like yeah. at least have that somewhere yeah. I don't mind the scenario in which like in Assassin's Creed I think is a good example where like maybe um, if I remember correctly I feel like Assassin's Creed 3 did this kind of okay where it was kind of like you have so many different methods of assassinating somebody and they gave you all the super basic ones at the beginning like you go from a high ledge and you like drop down on them you had around the corner and you stab them or whatever but then later in the game you get things like the um, rope dart, the rope dart and things like that and Which if i remember cool. correctly like there are some levels where it's like you're a, you're a decent way through the game until you've gotten this rope dart and then it get, puts you in a mission where killing the the target that way is quite obvious mm-hmm. and so therefore it teaches you the mechanic like yeah. part way through the game and like i'm totally no, yeah i'm fine with that, that because then yeah. i know i have that option on my next mission well that's right. that's what a lot of a lot of people say is that you shouldn't front load your tutorial right mm-hmm. if you teach mm-hmm. me all of the things at the beginning of the game i'm gonna forget two or three tactics yeah if you teach me uh like two or three important things at the beginning of the game i'm gonna remember those and then as the game continues pepper in it keeps it inter- interesting too because i find a lot of games that do have that kind of design you tend to then use that method in the next several levels until yeah. you get taught something else and i think it's cool because it makes every it makes the missions all different yeah yeah, well, it's like, hey, this is the this is the mission where you first get rope darts, and rope yeah. darts are focused in the design, so there's a lot of these yeah. trees where you get to use rope darts. Yeah. Yeah. Rope darts were cool. Yeah. They were, they were cool. awesome. Um, no, the other thing I was going to say about Final Fantasy, yes. and I think, I think <clears throat> straight out, I don't think this necessarily is, like, example of good or bad sequels or anything. I think Final Fantasy is a very, it's its own thing. Yeah. It's very weird. Um, because as far as, for the most part, like I was saying, like, none of them, um, like they're standalone games like you can mm-hmm. go in you can play them without playing the other ones um but they do kind of happen in the same world where all the mechanics exist and all the different and the science and the magic and the creatures and all that kind of stuff 
Um, sure. But every once in a while, there is a sequel that works with each other, and sometimes they make it obvious, and sometimes they don't. Um, like, I'm, I can't, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that Final Fantasy VIII is a prequel to Seven. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, and then... Or is it that nines are people to eight? One of this somewhere within seven, eight, and nine, I'm pretty sure they're related, but like they're I don't know how they're related, or they're, they're several years apart, or something like it's really weird. Are you? you I'm googling, googling it. Googling okay, it? Cool. Because okay. like there's the obvious one where you have like Assassin's Creed ten or Assassin's Creed Final <laughs> Fantasy ten and ten two. Yeah, which is the most obvious one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's again, it goes back to that thing that I was saying where I'm like, put so many numbers on it and. It's weird because we're fairly aware of, you know, like the gaming space, mm -hmm. but you've got to think about people who aren't. And when you're marketing and you're trying to like reach an audience, audience whatever, somebody who doesn't really know games, maybe they're getting into it, they're like younger, they yeah. just got their first consoles, a PS4, whatever, yeah. right? They see Final Fantasy fourteen, Final Fantasy yeah. fifteen. Yeah. they're like... I'm not playing these games. I got played yeah. fucking a dozen. Yeah, I to think know this game. I think Final Fantasy definitely, like I was saying, it's very unique in the sense where like people are very aware that that like Final Fantasy has its cult following, and that's kind of what they do. They just like mm. they've kept numbering them, and don't worry about it. Just They're just get, gonna just, do it. Just try one. Just play one. Right. Um, ten, ten, one, and ten, two are a little more obvious in the sense that they were obviously like true sequels in the sense that one occurred after the other. Mm -hmm. But the other thing about it too is that they came out quite um, quickly after each other too. Like oh, okay, I think cool. it was like it might have not even been a year when ten two came out. Um, and also in ten, uh, you play as Titus, um, and the story is like actually, if I remember correctly, it's something along the lines kind of like Final Fantasy fifteen, where you're trying to like go meet this girl you love or whatever and all this kind of stuff and you eventually meet her and he's from your party um, but you play as Titus and his crew and then in 10 2 you play as the girl oh, okay. and then all of her party and if I remember correctly it's not like a straight sequel like this it's more like an overlap yeah, sequel an overlap, where yeah. you like play the girl during parts where you were playing Titus in the last game um, so it was, it was it was kind of there to make it more obvious like 10 1 and 10 2 uh, they're both existing kind of at the same time but you're playing you're looking at two different perspectives mm -hmm. um i don't know what to say about 14 though because i know there's a bunch of parts of 14 i'm I pretty sure there's like 14 one and 14 two isn't it you can buy like 14 two the add i have no idea i thought it was an mmo 14 is an mmo yeah yeah okay well there is a, there definitely is a, it's either or is it 13 there's a 13 two it's I really think. 13 i think it's yeah, a 13 there's 14 13 13 mmo 13 it just is like getting expansions and stuff but yeah. it's an mmo so but uh, yeah final fantasy is very interesting it's such a specific style of game too like it's got like such a specific aesthetic to it like it's like people who are stuck in the 2000s wearing like edgy clothes and their hair being all up and spiky and like it's <laughs> You played more Final Fantasy 15 than I did. Yeah, you? and I just dropped off like cold turkey. I was yeah. just like, I think I got to a thing, and I was just like, I was just so tired of like the combat. That's the thing I have with. There's a lot of combat games where like halfway through the games just don't know how to make it challenging, so they just keep creating um like status effects. Yeah, and uh, I find that's very common from. Final Japanese Fantasy. style of RPGs and uh, yeah. Final Fantasy specifically and I think it's something to say that Final Fantasy 15 is one of the I don't know when they went to the action RPG style 15 I think is 15 like the first one yeah, yeah 14 so. and 13 still do turn based yeah because um, I think that might be the, the fault I think of that, I think 14 is a little different but again it's an MMO yeah. I think, it kind of I think that might be the fault of that is that they're, they, yeah. they're doing action RPG for the first time and trying to find ways to um, change the 15, 15 just felt like a hot mess to me it was just like uh, I spent the entire game picking my boys up and nothing, never ever did I was like I really hitting things yeah I hope to put that video out soon of like why I think both of us stopped playing Final Fantasy 15 and that is very fascinating but we're getting off topic um sequel sequels uh I have you know like a short list that I kind of made of stuff that we could talk about yeah but we are going for a while there's I think two more that I want to talk about specifically okay I want to talk about the Prince of Persia franchise. Fuck yeah, let's do it. And I want to talk about Dark Souls. Fuck yeah, let's do it. And then I think we'll probably... That'll right probably be good. I can't remember who I was talking to, just because well, I thought about it. It might have been one of you guys that, like, Prince of Persia, like, is a Assassin's Creed. It wasn't me. It wasn't me, but I... I can't remember who I was talking to, but yeah. apparently, like, literally, like, Assassin's Creed was supposed to be, like, Prince of Persia 4, but they decided to make it a new IP. Like, oh. it was, like... 
Because, like, apparently immediately when the Prince of Persia license ran out, that's when they got the Assassin's Creed license, and, like, a bunch of the assets are already made, because it was supposed to be the next, like, Prince of Persia game, but they turned into huh. Assassin's Creed. Um, because thinking about it, like, there are a lot of, like, aesthetically, the type of gameplay is very similar. No, yeah, that and, makes like, sense, hmm. but that that's actually the kind of thing that we were talking about earlier that I kind of like, where they're like, this has now become different enough. Mm-hmm. Like, it might have been a legal thing, licensing, whatever, but it ended up, I think, being a good decision, yeah. because it's like, this yeah. is now different enough that it isn't Prince of Persia. Yeah. Like, if that game had come out as a Prince that of Persia game... That franchise wouldn't it'd be anywhere near as big as it, as it is now. No, I think it succeeded. And it also would have irritated Prince people who like Prince of Persia. I would have played yeah. I would have played it and been like, eh, this isn't Prince right. Of, where's my Sands of Time, please? Yeah. But, so Prince of Persia started life as, what, like a Super Nintendo game? Oh, Super Nintendo. Like it was probably, yeah. Way old game, side-scrolling game. Yeah, it was a 16-bit game. I'm not sure if it was also on the Sega Genesis or something, but... So... Well, Super Nintendo would have been 32-bit, so... so if it was 16, it would have been the original Nintendo. No, that's 8-bit. Oh. Um, 16-bit was Super Nintendo. Was it? Yeah. Oh. So, like, did we just skip 32? Oh, that was, yeah. you know what? That was, like, the expansion, like, the 32X on, like, yeah. the Sega Genesis and stuff. There wasn't really a 32-bit generation. Super, there wasn't a 32-bit Nintendo yeah. either. Yeah, No, that's, yeah. But, um... That's what I was saying, yeah. Yeah. You're correct. Um, but, yeah, no, I think it was one of those. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was, like, a 2D side-scroller. Apparently, it was super difficult. Yeah. And it, like, was super fucking hard. But and, it got like, revived with the sort of trilogy. Yeah, um, it got revived on, like, the GameCube, Xbox, PS2. PS2. Yeah, I played yeah. it on PS2. I never played the first of that new trilogy. The first one was the best I know, one. I, I'm it's really sad good. I never played it. I don't think oh. I ever played any of the other uh, ones. I never the finished the sequel, but I played the hell out of the third one. The third one was Two good. Thrones. I didn't mind. I, the third one was actually my least favorite. Um, I remember it was good. I hated it. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. No, I thought it was a great. I thought it was a great way to end that whole shebang. I thought it was super good. I should go back and play those games. They're fun. I should fun. play the first of those ones. We should play the first one, but but we should also play Halo. The thing that's weird is that then it got rebooted again after that. Yeah, it did, it and was... I think it might have gotten rebooted twice because there were two different new Prince of Persia's. Yeah, that came out. It wasn't one a movie tie-in? Was it? If it was, it, it was, it was done, it might have been done to, like, be, like, tied around the movie, but it wasn't, it didn't, like, use movie assets or, like, anything like that. Yeah, it wasn't like, it Jake wasn't, Gyllenhaal. It wasn't Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh, um, uh, but there was... Prince of Persia, There was Jake Gyllenhaal. one that was just called Prince of Persia, and it was, like, a young prince. Yeah, it was a cel-shaded prince with a metal gauntlet, and, and he like was, a he helped this out this female girl. spirit oh, yeah. companion. Yeah, they had a side-scroller, but I think it's, it wasn't, like, a... It wasn't like Nintendo was like, oh, this is like our franchise, like this is Metroid or something, right? It was like an old game, and Ubisoft was like, we're gonna make a 3D, whatever. And I just, I just think it was an interesting decision, um, instead of just making a new, a new, a new thing because yeah. it wasn't really connected to it, right? Like they make a new Metroid, it's still Samus, it's still that. They make a new Zelda from the old days, it's still Link, mm-hmm. but like it's not, it doesn't really have any connective tissue, and it wasn't like a super beloved franchise yeah. that had a lot of I don't remember it being super popular I just remember that game being really good <laughs> they made way more Prince of Persia games than I remember really eh? so uh, for like the original series there were like th- th- four three okay. Prince of Persia Prince of Persia 2 The Shadow of the Flame and Prince of Persia 3D Arabian Nights which came out in 99 Oh, right. was a 3D game look at that right uh, so then yeah then the first one that came out on the PS2 for the reboot was Sense of Time then it was Warrior Within yep. 2004 and then the Two Thrones, yep, was two thousand six, oh, uh, which also simultaneously got released with Revelations for the PSP and Battles of the Prince of Persia for the DS. Um, and then the next console one wasn't for a while. It looks like a bunch of platformer ones. Yeah, Rival Stars, Prince of Persia Classic, Prince of Persia, yeah, like Game Boy games. And okay, yeah. Like so two thousand eight is the Prince of Persia one you're talking about. Yeah, just like the cel shaded uh, duel. Yeah. And I remember actually like enjoying the gameplay quite a bit. But I just never finished it because, again, it was like it was pretty samey. They got rid of like the rewind time mechanic mm-hmm. that I really Which enjoyed. Which was yeah. really integral to sort of and then what that felt. And then about. the Forgotten Sands. Yeah. yeah. Forgotten Sands I really liked, actually, because they added... They had the rewind time mechanic, but they also gave you like other elemental powers. Oh. That yeah, I just remember this stuff. looking very movie-ish because they gave him the long hair. He always had long hair. That long? Yeah. I mean, if you look at Warrior it's Within. It's fuller, because, like, before it was, like, it was basically just, like, a thin, like, sheet over his head. Yeah, like, I'm, yeah, it's, like, a little, like, 
I don't know. It's just, just that shot. So yeah, it's just like the shot that looks like the jig jig. Um, just rewinding time was so good in that game. You're like, oh, fucked up there. But they added this mechanic. Um, most of the other ones, like being able to control earth and air and fire, mostly just played into like combat, if I recall. Um, maybe a little bit of platforming with air. But water was really cool because you could freeze water. And they did like these puzzles where like I remember one room in specific like specifically where you would like run up a wall and then you'd jump and you had to like freeze water because there's like a water spout spout mm-hmm. and then you'd freeze it and like swing mm. off it and then sw- you had to unfreeze water and go through a waterfall and then freeze water again and like land on the opposite waterfall as it froze and then like wall jump up in between the two frozen waterfalls mm. and so you had to like be managing that while you were platforming and they actually like implemented it into the core gameplay that you go to play Prince of Persia for, oh. but made this new mechanic of this ability to like manipulate your environment. That sounds fun. And it was actually really cool. Like I thought it was really neat. Like yeah. the story was like lackluster and it didn't really do anything new that I was like I, I got my, my fill narratively. The first one yeah. was still good. But the yeah. last one I think. The second one I remember being strange. You're going like some ship for some reason. I can't remember. Well it why. went from it also went from a T rating to an M rating and then went back to a T rating. Yeah it did. And it was just, like, Shetty, the, like, chick, just, like, was wearing, like, metal lingerie. Yep. And the prince was just screaming, fucking bitch, all the time. What the hell? Like, it and just... was, like, decapitating things. Yeah. <clears throat> and there was metal music everywhere. Weird. I remember turning off the music. Yeah. Because I, I hated metal then. I'm pretty sure I would play it with the music. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, back. you just played through Doom, so probably. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Doom. So good. But... That's how you do a reboot. But I think that's something that's interesting is that through all of its permutations, they didn't really change. Like, I feel like they've actually always tried to do something interesting with it. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, they got rid of the time mechanic, but then... Added this weird Navi helper. Who, like, so you couldn't die. Yeah. But it wasn't satisfying because it wasn't something that you had to do or manage. You just, like, she, you fall and she saves you and you do it again. Yeah. Um, but they also added, like, ceiling running because of the metal gauntlet. Which like didn't make any sense, but it was like a fun like again they're like trying to add new things to the yeah. the base thing right basically there's like these metal hooks in the ceiling, and you like run in between them and you like grab the next hook and like sort of propel yourself. Yeah. I thought the gauntlet somehow made you like run with your feet, and I was really confused. I was like, no. okay, magic, why not? But yeah, no, it's like that. you like you, yeah you like climb you and run then with you your pull hands. And then, and then, yeah, I think. So. Oh, yeah. I kind of I think I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I think I see that, yeah. You like try and like dig into the earth. For like one pull to like reach to the next hook, I think. Um, but I don't sure. Know. Yeah, it it was fun. But, <laughs> but I again, they were. Tr- I think it was them trying to do new things in sequels, yeah. right? They're like exactly. We've got this. Is no is a good thing. Assassin's Creed. But I mean, I mean in the sense of taking their core mechanic and evolving it. Is no is a good thing. Assassin's Creed. Yeah. No. True. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I just think it's. Uh, I'm. I'll be interested if we ever get like a new one that new comes out at some point, Prince like a new Persia? Prince of Persia, and see oh, what yeah. they do and what happens and if it's going to be a reboot or whatever. Because it's a. They seem to want to tell like the same story with the same character and then like and start it again and do it, it different. Yeah, kind of Legend of Zelda style. Yeah, make it turn it into. What its if own we found myth? out that the boy from the Assassin's Creed Origins is the Prince of Persia guy? Well, no, that'd be racist. <laughs> Same. No, no, it couldn't. Like at all. Um, he's not Egypt. He's, oh. So he's then, the same part of the world. Yeah. Okay. Um. I. That's that. Anyway. Dark Souls. You know where Egypt is. Yes. Okay. Dark Souls is game. No, it's not. It's, Dark Souls is really good. It's torture. Really fun <laughs> to play. It's not a game. But it has a very interesting... One of the things people talk about a lot with games is replayability. Mm-hmm. And obviously, Sean, we've played the Souls games more than Brandon has. Yeah. Um, I've only played three in Bloodborne, but... But you've played them much I've, more I've than Brandon has. I've played one a little bit. But yeah, and i played both more than Brandon. Because I've, I've beat one, two, three, Bloodborne. Mm-hmm. But you've probably sunk more hours into three in Bloodborne specifically than I have. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I talk about a lot with those, that I talk about with them, is um, that I do. That I say, when I say what I'm talking about. When I talk about No, Sean. Turtles. Sean. No. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> but one of the things. <laughs> Sorry for us not to do that anymore. There, there, it is yeah. eleven thirty. Um, one of the things that I talk about when I talk about Dark Souls, why not? Because this is live. No, we've already said that it's we record live. on Monday. No, no. Shut up. <laughs> Don't ever remind me of that Devolver Digital fiasco. Don't is it, is even. It, is it live? Dare. Or is it live, guys? <laughs> <laughs> um. One of the things that I always say is like, oh, I wish, yes, I don't, can we move on? Um, I wish that I could replay it for the first time and not already know where everything is. I know what you mean. And like, some people, and like, this is obviously personal, but like, some people really enjoy getting into the meta and knowing the numbers and like, I know that if I have this weapon I can defeat this enemy really easily because of like the stagger it has or whatever. Mm-hmm. But for me, one of the things that I enjoy is like, I play every game, every Dark Souls game with a longsword and a shield. Because I like long swords, and I like shields, and that's just what I want to do. I want to make that work, however hard that is and however long it takes me. I'm playing it with a long sword and a shield, so for me there isn't as much replayability. Because like I go to try out another weapon, and I inevitably just end up using the using long a long sword and shield. Yeah. Um. But I, they the sequels sort of have, they sort of create the replayability in the sense that the core mechanics are the same. And I play it with the same weapons, even though they introduce new ones. But I get the replayability because the thing that I love is that sense of exploring the space for the first time mm-hmm. and not knowing where those enemies are and not knowing how to beat the boss yet and having to learn him. Mm-hmm. So once I do, there's a piece of the game missing. Mm. Yeah, I get you. And so for me, getting the sequels of games like that is great because I get to like, all right, I get, I take my sword boy, my sword and shield boy. And I go into a new territory. It's almost like I'm taking the same character and playing in a new space. But how bad would it be if it, you. they made it open world, though? How bad would it be? Yeah. If they made it an open world game. Well, it wouldn't be Dark Souls. That's Yeah. But that's like what a lot of games do with sequels. And I'm, I'm glad that From Software has never done that. I don't think yeah. they They've would. never made that choice for well, their because series. Because the thing is, part of the identity of the game is very much that. The labyrinth that labyrinthine situation. Oh, yep. we're losing battery life. Maybe we should just wrap this on. Wrap it up. Any last thoughts? Um, anything. Work on your sequels, publishers. Sequels. I think. I think that I they think work best when they are evolving mechanics and not just adding new things. I, I don't mind them adding new things, but I, I hate them adding new pillars of play. Mm-hmm. No, that's what I mean. Right, like or, I. W- or when they start iterating and they added a new pillar that fit in that one offshoot, like, but then yeah. it becomes a core pillar. Like, just really quickly, Mass Effect, for me, I felt like the first Mass Effect felt less like Mass Effect than Mass Effects 2 and 3. Oddly enough, I felt like the weird... They removed the non-essential pillars of play. Exactly, the whole RPG thing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. They just kind of, like, lessened it made it more action-oriented, I think is where Mass Effect wanted to go initially anyway. Yeah. But that's just really quick. I thought that was a really good example of like a, a sequel. But uh, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. We'll be back next week. We've got some smaller videos that we're working on that are coming, so that's happening. Stay like it to, and subscribe to like like it like and across. They're all down here. We're all good. All the things are. Hanks. All of the YouTube things um, that you know yeah. about. Also, if you guys want us to do a certain thing, just let shoot us know it out. and yeah. tell us what your favorite video game sequels are and why they worked or why some other ones didn't. Because I think this is a discussion that could go on much longer. I agree. We, I might, think we even might do even... another part at exactly. some point. Exactly. Yeah. Because like thinking about it, I'm like, oh, I want to talk about Gears of War. I want to talk about Halo. But like, yeah, we, we just don't have the time. We don't have time. All right. Cool. Sayonara. Bye, Great Thumbs. Let's play Dishonored again.